Smith's stories are so just marinated in irony, uh, in this sort of delicious sort of uh, oppositeness, that uh, capturing that, uh, that's the thing that I think a lot of people miss. The, the, you can try the, the, the really dense prose, you can, you can have the, you know, the, the, the doomed hero and the, and the sense of, uh, of larger doom over, uh, overarching over things and, and the absurdity of life, and still miss the point. Uh, of that, that, that fundamental underlying irony of, of the, you know, the absurdity of meaning itself. I mean, you had no idea where the story was going to go. Uh, where so many of these stories, I mean, Robert E. Howard, you've read, you've read four of them, you know what's going to happen. You know how he's going to, how he's going to break these things, how he's going to play the, uh, play the narrative out. Uh, with Smith, uh, his, it, it had a free hand because the, the axes of what he was trying to get done. He's not trying to show the, this character dominating all these other characters or, or achieving the quest. I mean, probably my, my favorite of his stories like that I look at is like the most poignant is the, uh, the quest of King Uvaran. With, with the hat, <laughs> and the hat blows away, and it's just a man chasing a hat. And you know, as a wise man once said in uh, Miller's Crossing, there's nothing more ridiculous than a man chasing his hat. And that was what was so fascinating about that triumvirate, is you had, I mean, well, it, all those, all the other satellites therein, but, but Lovecraft and Howard and Smith, these three guys who had nothing in common whatsoever except an extraordinary visionary capability, and they were totally in the wrong, in the wrong you know, time. Lovecraft should have been an 18th century uh, English gentleman. Uh, Howard should have been born, you know, uh, before recorded history. And, and, and Smith probably would have, been, would have been very happy as a, pre, as a high priest of Atlantis. Uh, and that was, you know, it was, it was that they didn't belong. And so they were talking past each other so often, but they were a vital lifeline in validating and valorizing each other's, you know, otherness and weirdness. And I think, yeah, I, I, it must have felt really sad for Smith to feel like he'd been, you know, left behind all of those channels of going dark and feeling like maybe this is a, a, a lost pursuit. Maybe this isn't such a, a great way to spend a life. Because I always call the Cthulhu mythos pulp existentialism. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, and so, you know, Smith has this, this sense of pulp poetics that uh, that makes it that, that gives the, that has a human place uh, because Lovecraft you know fails to really have a place for human beings. You're, we're there and we're there and, you know, to witness it, uh, but we're outside of it. And Smith put us back inside that otherness and that weirdness. And again, characters wouldn't run screaming from it. They try to figure out how to profit off of it or mate with it or something. And and that's what and that is something that that he that, that Lovecraft misses is our, our adaptability. Everybody discovers Lovecraft in adolescence when they're first you know confronting their mortality and this and the universe doesn't care. And uh, and so it resonates so powerfully. And uh, with Smith, I think. Uh, not everybody that discovers it at the same time in adolescence really finds something there. Uh, I, I keep going back to his stuff and reading it and finding more there. I think there's still things to find there in middle age. And I think that's part of it, is that Lovecraft's, Lovecraft posits an apocalypse. You know, the violent trampling down of everything that, that is, which kind of sucks, you know. And so, and so there's a half, you know, he's, he's dreading it, but really kind of hungering for it. Whereas Smith's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a big colossal collapsing. It's, it's, it's a dissolution, and it's very slow and sad. It's the sun going down, and it is very more analogous to the pains and fears and aspirations and dreams of middle age. And I, that's why I think I'm, I'm starting to become more of a Smith fan than I ever was before. And, and not like leaving Lovecraft behind, but feeling like, yeah, I've kind of done that. And, but I'm seeing in, in Smith stuff, in this sort of melancholy, uh, rather than a, than a furious despair. I'm seeing, uh, I, 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 it's really starting to speak to me on more levels than before which is kind of wondrous. I like to, I, I, I find myself often, ever since that, of course, I, I find myself dwelling on, you know, what could be the kind of modern thing that would speak to audiences and make, you know, Smith's Hyperborea or Zatik universe really, really, uh, really leap forward. I, I think, I think like if heavy metal did some sort of an animated thing, that's why I've been after uh, like my friend Skinner, who's also from Auburn, and uh, is a big fan of Clark Ashton. You, you haven't talked to Skinner? Uh, uh, yeah. You're gonna go back over with me. We're gonna go find Skinner later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a huge, uh, huge Clark Ashton Smith. Fan.
like some people would say that you have a a duty or an obligation to fulfill the potential of your abilities and to see how far you can go you know i mean that's why our culture is 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 limited creatively because it's based on demographic studies and gross manipulation and advertising and trying to to make money off of the actual free spirited creative will of the people that's disturbing as shit so whenever you do something that's in like in defiance of that that's to me the most profound glory that you can have even though you're poor it's like you're like, yeah, I'm poor and I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to write a poem about Pepsi, man. I'm going to write a poem about a wizard that, in, you know, took your soul. Now you got to get it back, but good luck with that shit. Because he's got millions of souls. And there's no Pepsi, you know, room for Pepsi in there anywhere, you know. Yeah, that, that's what I think. Like, if the universe is going to witness itself through the power of an alien wizard, then it better look amazing to me. But yeah, that's why I see like sweeping, grand, bizarre, like, yeah. like laughing, ha ha ha. Like it, you're in a hallway, you know, in one of those stories, you could just hear the wizard's voice. Mm-hmm. You're like, what the shit? Uh, the the idea, the concepts of psychedelic. Uh, people have like kind of boiled it down and uh, down into this idea of like you're on drugs and and there's colors everywhere or something but really uh, psychedelic experiences or understanding things in a through a psychedelic lens is really about um, the profoundness of things hitting you and so you're able to actually live in a psychedelic state if you key your mind into that stuff when your mind is tuned into a psychedelic frequency, things things don't make your don't make sense. Things are just happening. It's our mind's intention to correlate stuff. And that's what that and that's the mind trying to control things to not be psychedelic because then it's manageable to process. So he's creating psychedelic instances where it's kind of up to you to pull back with your mind, not just read the crazy words and and understand them, but to withhold your mind's um, insistence that it has to make sense of stuff and just trip out. That's the intention. Let me take you on this bizarre trip. Now check all this stuff out. Now here's the people and these are their intentions and this is what they've done before. Isn't that crazy? Because I had kind of hated Auburn so much as this sort of forgotten, shitty town that represented a lot of things that I found to be vapid about just existing. Like, I mean, all my friends in high school were like, I, I could see like their future of like construction work and doing all this stuff and having a family and being, you know, and I could see this like tiredness for anticipating the future in their faces. And I was like, I can't have this shit. I gotta get out of Auburn, I hate it. So when I found out that Clark, about Clark Ashton Smith, like, you know, when I was in my early 20s or whatever, uh, I had gotten all enthusiastic. Like, I felt proud, actually, to be from Auburn. I was like, oh, maybe it's the thing that I hated was the very thing that really encouraged me to kind of become this kind of bizarre, visionary, creative person uh, focused on discovery or whatever, you know what I mean? And learning and tripping out on the possibility of imagination. So, I mean, so I kind of went from hating Auburn to sort of adoring it in this way where I was like, even this place, you know, regardless of the parameters of the people and the things like it really grew out this person Clark Ashton Smith and there's a like a ton of other weirdos that have come from Auburn and that area too so I kind of like love it now actually because when I look at his drawings or his sculptures regardless if I knew who he was I would just see in it like that's 
that's a that's somebody who's in that moment doing that shit and it's that's the art for art's sake you know it's so beautiful man it's like it touches my heart when i see this evidence of this person existing in this way that was that was pure to them